on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Foraging is inherently sustainable and regenerative. If your foraging is not, it's actually not foraging. I would call it poaching. Native people worked this landscape so hard into some kind of permacultured environment that was perfect for the foraging and hunting that they were doing. Cahokia was a city in Collinsville, Illinois, around 850 AD to 1250 AD. It was larger than contemporary London. That makes things like foraging seem so obvious. Of course we want to make sure we keep this alive, even if we are city people. When you pick up that mushroom, that mushroom is busy spreading its spores to a degree that it could never have hoped for. He's trying to cut things out all the time. It's like, hey, you need more genetics in your diet. Your lonely ass needs to meet some more species. Being around these plants, tasting them, learning about them, eating something at the peak of ripeness. Money can't buy almost anything that foragers do. I mean, food is the greatest Trojan horse for knowledge. Episode 131 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Food is a Trojan Horse for Knowledge, with Tim Clemens, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. You've got to try the new naturally flavored colostrum from Sir Thrival. Chocolate with real cacao, vanilla with real vanilla extract, strawberry with real strawberry juice. I've been using colostrum daily and promoting it as a powerful nutritional supplement for over 15 years. In fact, I just had a quarter cup in my blended drink this morning and again this afternoon. With its ability to fortify your immune system, nourish and rebuild your gut lining, repair injuries, aid in muscle growth, growth and recovery, and so much more. I think it's one of the most sophisticated food-based supplements we can include in our diet. Sir Thrival is already known as the number one source for premium colostrum, and now they've just released three new formulas, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. They're lightly sweetened with monk fruit and combined with MCT oil to make them more soluble in water and in blended drinks, all while having the same potency as Sir Thrival's original colostrum. They're so good, I keep eating them by the spoonful right out of the tub. Eaten like that, they're like a powdered ice cream, but of course, they make excellent blended drinks too. Again, these aren't those over-the-top fake flavors you taste in so many supplements today. These are flavored with real cacao, vanilla, and strawberry, so they taste great and really clean too. Go to SirThrival.com to see the entire lineup of health-promoting supplements and superfoods and use the coupon code WILDFED for 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you could thrive? Are you looking to source foraged wild food ingredients or products for your restaurant, store, product line, or just your own personal use? Or maybe you're a small business owner in the wild food space or a hobbyist forager looking for a side hustle. Then listen up. This episode's brought to you by Foraged.Market, a website for both buyers and sellers of wild and specialty foods from around the globe. Think Etsy, but for foods with a story. If you're buying, you'll find plenty of sellers vetted to ensure that they use sustainable practices, carrying those rare, hard-to-find ingredients like ramps, fiddleheads, chaga, truffles, hickory nuts, huckleberries, wild rice, and more. I've personally been using the site to source ingredients for my own company. And remember, if you have products to sell, you can get your own product page to promote your goods, exposing them to a constant stream of ideal buyers. Go over to forage.market slash wildfed to get started. There you'll find a coupon code for $10 off your first order. Forage.market. Buy there, sell there, and learn more about their incredible vision and conservation ethic by listening to episode 122 of the Wildfed podcast. Forage.market, the global marketplace for wild and specialty foods. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to the Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Tim Clemens, a.k.a. MN Forager on Instagram, is the founder of Ironwood Foraging Co., a Minnesota-based wild food and foraging education company, and someone I've been writing back and forth with on social media for some time now. He was formerly the president of the Minnesota Mycological Society, which gives him a deep expertise on edible fungi, and he also has a degree in anthropology and archaeology, so his perspectives on foraging are firmly grounded in an understanding of big human history. 
We finally got a chance to meet up for a podcast and discuss our foraging philosophies. Over the years, his page is one of the places I've visited to keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening in the wild food world and to get new ideas of species I might want to chase down, harvest, and ultimately eat myself. Like me, he's not afraid to get experimental, even playing with entomophagy, eating species like invasive Japanese beetles, or making unusual recipes for his blog like black ant ice cream. But bigger picture, he thinks we need more people, not less, out there foraging and for very similar reasons that I do. People only care about what they know about. Like Tim says in this interview, food is a Trojan horse for knowledge. And while both he and I are passionate about teaching people to feed themselves on foods they harvest from the landscape, ultimately, we're both really reacquainting people with nature itself. And that, beyond food, has the power to create real positive change. Because people who aren't acquainted with nature are just never going to be able to live harmoniously with it. In other words, foraging is a practice with very real and important ecological implications, both in the short term, but also on the longer timeline too. When Tim says that despite the challenges we face with potential overharvest or pushback we get for harvesting from wild lands and species, more people should be out there foraging, I couldn't agree more. Tim Clemens, welcome to the show. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Man, it's been so long. I've followed you for years on Instagram. And uh, you're somebody who's, uh, when you comment on my posts, like you're somebody whose comments I've always taken really seriously, you know? So uh, I guess it's uh, about time you're here. And I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you saying that. It's really kind. Yeah, I've been following your podcast for years now, both of them, and your account. And it's really great to see you blossoming like you are. Um, it's an exciting time because I feel like um, there's such a, a big interest in the kind of things we're into right now. And it uh, seems like it's coming for a lot of different reasons. And so one thing I'm wondering, because you have a forging school, um, and I'm curious if you've been seeing that same big uptick. But before we go there, why don't you just tell people a little bit about who you are, uh, what your projects are, and um, you know what you're into? Yeah, so Tim Clemens, uh, I'm... 33. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, So I started foraging probably about 10 years ago, but have been doing it uh, all my life since I can remember, but just started being a practice and an intention um, about 10 years ago. Um, I I am the founder of Ironwood Foraging uh, here in Minneapolis. I made that company to offer hands-on foraging experiences for people in the Minneapolis metro area. I like to garden, uh, do some martial arts, played rugby for many years. So I kind of have a lot of irons in the fire. Um, yeah, I, th- I think seemingly like you too. I feel like you are involved in a, a ton of different things. Then foraging is just one of them, right? Yeah, I was looking at your page again this morning and I was like, I, I got the impression you trained. You know, I saw you doing a lot of cold water immersion stuff. And so, you know, in the last few years for me, I've I've made my social presence, my social media and public presence really focused on the wild food piece because I feel like, um, I don't know why I do that, but <laughs> obviously I have a, a much more dynamic life. That's just one one piece of what I'm into, but I got the same impression looking at what you're doing. Uh, looks like you get involved in all kinds of things. Yeah, I guess to answer the first part of your question too is um, at Ironwood Foraging, yes, I've seen a huge uptick in uh, interest in foraging. So I started it in 2017. That was really when it was still just a brainchild. And then I took family and friends out over the next two years um, and then really started taking public workshops, seriously speaking engagements um, in 2022. That was always the plan. So, you know, in April of 2022, that was my five year plan that on that uh, date, I would go full time foraging. (laughs) Just so happened to, uh, you know, just so happened to coincide with um, the lockdowns and the pandemic. So, um, it did work out perfectly for me. I think I had a different experience of the last two years than many people because I was outside engaging with people, um, in a safe way. So yeah, I've just seen a a, a marked uptick in just 
all swaths of society. And that continues this year. I think this is my busiest year yet. So, Yeah, that was the big question early on. I remember talking to a lot of people during the lockdowns, like, hey, do you think we're going to see this um, drop off? And a lot of people said, yeah, I think I think it's going to drop off as soon as things go back to normal. And I don't know that we're like, you know, what normal is, but we we're kind of back now, but there seems to be like this continued interest in, in wild foods. And, and I'm seeing it from the media side growing tremendously. Um, you know, so many people I know getting involved in media projects around foraging, hunting and fishing. And um, to me, that's just saying like, hey, the public's really interested in at least at the consumer level to to view it, if nothing else. But yeah, it's pretty amazing, man. I, I wanted to ask you about, so you've got this you have a um, anthropology degree. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and then also some uh, Ojibwe um, uh, background as well. So I'm just kind of curious how those two things play in for you, like how they feed into what you do, and also um, like big picture, like why wild foods for you in the first place. You know, not necessarily the whole backstory of it, but just like what, why big picture philosophy, like why. What attracts you to the practices um, around wild food and, and, and especially to make it such a big part of your life? Yeah, so I will say that how my anthropology and Ojibwe background affect this is that it sets everything I do in a cultural understanding and it gives that perspective. Um, but also applying it to my larger philosophy and in like a exact way is pretty difficult. It's more of an intuition. And, you know, when I started foraging as a practice, it was specifically for, um, I was in college and I was taking a class from Peba Mibinese, uh, Dennis Jones, Peba Mibinese is his Ojibwe name. And uh, I was taking a, an Ojibwe language and culture class. We had a project that was assigned to us to do a paper on a traditional Ojibwe activity. Timing turned out that it was around this time of year, so I was able to go to Sugarbush or Eskigamizigunning, which is um, which means place where you boil the sap. And so I was sitting out there in the sugar bush. And I think anyone who's done that process themselves knows that it is a lot like watching water boil. <laughs> so um, your mind has time to wander. Yeah. And what mine wandered to was, you know, the other trees around me and the plants poking up. And I'm at heart, definitely a city kid. I mean, Minneapolis, we're lucky to have some of the most green space for a city of our size in the country. But absolutely, I did not have... Um, even a suburban upbringing. I was fully in the city. So uh, to be in this area really sparked something in me that I think was always there. But this was the the feeling of like an uplifting or a battery being charged that I wasn't fully aware of. Um, and that has really, that's propelled me, I mean, f- easily for the last 10 years and definitely for the rest of my life um, into foraging. The anthropology piece is neat because, and and I gotta say, like I feel like obligated to say, you know, Sam Thayer's really like turned my thinking around about what anthropology is and what its origins are, and I know, yeah. I'm sure you guys have spoken about that as well for the listeners. You know, he's just maybe some of some of the folks listening have heard me talk a little bit about it, but he's got this manuscript just really tracing the the colonialist sort of racist origins of anthropology in a way that's so compelling that I. I can't quite see it the same way, but I still have a real love for the idea of that as a science, you know, looking at human beings, particularly from like a zoological perspective is most interesting to me. And and um, it gives you that big, big history view of people, right? Because I, I think like, especially like you were saying, growing up in the built environment where you almost have the sense like this is how humans are supposed to be. And then you get into anthropology and you get the big picture view and you realize like, oh, we've only just started doing this. This is what we actually do is this, you know, hunting gathering thing, this like living on the landscape and, and living with a really different social structure. And something I've heard you talk a little bit about, um, also a really different language structure. Um, like we're living in a very unnatural time for ourselves. 
Uh, and anthropology gives you a big picture view of that. Um, and then things like foraging seem so, I don't know, I mean, at least for me, I want, I'm curious your opinion on it, but it makes things like foraging seem so obvious, like this thing that of course we want to make sure we keep this alive, even if we are city people, even if we live in the, like I, I noticed you offer um, a few urban foraging classes. I just love that, man. I think that is so important. <laughs> um, really do. And I've always loved it. Like if I'm going traveling somewhere, man, I'm often picking things, you know, in the city. I, I love to, uh, there's something about that that feels really fun for me. So anyway, I love that you do yeah, that, think, you know? Yeah. I think the urban foraging classes that I do are the most important and they're also my favorite. They are not the most well attended. Um, because I think, you know, you have to get into foraging a little bit already to understand kind of the miracle that is urban foraging. Um, and also, I think when you get into foraging, it allows you, again, that perspective to see that, um, you know, nature isn't out there. It's actually everywhere. Like even in the city, even in Minneapolis, where it's, you know, mostly concrete and cars and houses, it, that's all just in nature. It's not outside of nature. And when you can look on a landscape, specifically right now through foraging and see the abundance and see the connections, it's not as hard to realize that you're still in nature and you can look on a landscape that, you know, maybe seems disenchanted uh, and you can add that enchantment back in. It does a lot of good for people. Man, it really does. And also from the perspective of a forager, disturbance is, you know, I mean, like here in Maine where there's so much forest cover and often the foraging isn't very good until you get to those places where humans have really disturbed the landscape. And so sometimes right. it's like the city has some actually really great opportunities that you might not find out in the countryside. Huh? Exactly. And I'll, I mean, if you forage for say invasives, you know, your garlic mustard, um, maybe the, the European genetics of stinging nettle as opposed to the native stinging nettle, um, dandelions, I mean, they're coming out so much sooner than your native plants. And so a lot of people that maybe aren't initiated into foraging yet, um, they, you know, they want to go out to a state park that seems like wilderness to them. Um, albeit this is only about 30 minutes away from Minneapolis. So it's not, it's definitely curated wilderness. Um, but what I'd say is I'm, you know, let's go to that local park that, that lake or, you know, on the edge of this golf course, not on the golf course, but, um, that's where you're going to find all the good stuff. Yeah. And this idea of a, like a pristine wilderness, you know, I think it's been probably in the last like two decades, there's been this real shift in thinking here in North America, as we start to understand that North America was a curated wilderness anyway. It's not like, yeah, you know, not like the a huge kind garden. Of, yeah. As opposed to, let's say like a lot of, you know, northern alaska or northern yukon or something where you have kind of real wilderness but but yeah this was really gardened really curated so i was wondering if you could speak to that as well because you know um native people worked this landscape so hard over such a long period of time well you know what what do you think probably 10 to fourteen thousand years and uh from that last glaciation on and absolutely turned it into some kind of you know what i don't know what to call it it's like uh, so I guess what Sam calls ecoculture, but kind of this like almost like permacultured environment that was, you know, perfect for the foraging and hunting that they were doing. Yeah. So I would even push that date back more to like 23,000 years ago. Um, there was recently a discovery in White Sands National Park in the Southwest United States that found some, those footprints. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're finding more. So, um, and I always kind of knew that in my anthropology undergrad, I was always arguing with my professors saying that there's no way human habitation started in North America in, you know, 15,000 years ago. And that we find 15,000 year old, um, you know, your Clovis points or habitation sites in the northernmost tip of North America and the southernmost tip of South America at the same time. Crazy, I mean, right? De yeah, archaeology, it, you are dealing with um, m the opacity of history and the fact that you haven't found nearly even like 1% of what's actually out there, um, much of which has been destroyed or covered up, you know, because coastal living used to be the way to do things mostly. And most of our coasts are gone yeah. from yeah. too far uh, long ago. Um, so I always was arguing, saying like, 
it's at minimum if it's if it's passed like 20,000 years ago then you open the door to 40,000 years ago <laughs> and i think yeah i mean i think north america north american archaeology is you know i think i'm not going to put words in sam's mouth but i think we'd vibe on this topic it north american archaeology much like european archaeology was created for a reason it wasn't pure you know you know enlightenment rationalism it was used as a tool to justify actions that were being done at the time um, and in north america that was the destruction of native nations um, and life ways and the imposition of the european life ways on this continent um, so once you look at it through that lens it makes sense why a certain narrative has been pushed for the last 150 years 200 years um, versus what could easily be the truth if you kind of soberly consider the the data that we even have and we don't even have a lot um but yeah eastern north america i mean you have cities like cahokia have you ever been no i haven't been so cahokia is in collinsville illinois so southern illinois right across the mississippi river from st louis missouri um st louis missouri actually rests upon a similar city uh, as Cahokia, um, as most of our East Coast cities and cities actually across the continent um, rest upon um, cities of Native nations. Go figure, people knew where to live and where the best places to live were. Um, but yeah, Cahokia was a city of about, you know, anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 if you include its uh, suburban hinterlands. It existed from around 850 AD to 1250 AD, and it was larger than contemporary London, um, and it would not be surpassed uh, north of the Rio Grande as the biggest city until Philadelphia uh, <laughs> surpassed it eventually, and wow. you know the nation's capital at the time surpassed it in population. It was a fantastic place. They, they grew what was called the Eastern Agricultural Complex uh, suite of domesticated plants. Uh, it includes things that you'll find like, um, you know, lamb's quarters. That's a common first forageable for a lot of people. It's also called goosefoot, I think, if you're out west. But Kenopodium berlandieri is the Latin name. It's related to quinoa. Um, these are all pre-corn, pre-maize uh, crops. The sunflower, sumpweed, also called marsh elder, uh, erect barley, I mean, erect knotweed and little barley. Um, and you can visit... Cahokia now, it's about to become a national park. Oh, wow. Um, okay. It is already a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and you can still find the plants that they domesticated. They did end up switching to corn, um, but you can still find like the feral uh, domesticates, is what they call them. They were domesticated and they've gone back to their wild state or something halfway between. But they're still growing um, there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's just escaped cultivation. It's like if we all um, stopped farming our farm fields and um, you know, there might be some corn still running around, but it wouldn't look like big fat ears. It would look, you know, something more diminished. Yeah. It's interesting you bring this up. I just received a book in the mail called Feeding Cahokia and, um, having the author on That's soon cool. to talk about it. Yeah. Cool. So I have, Gail? yeah, I haven't, <laughs> She's cool. I haven't yeah. dug into that book at all yet, but I'm, it just arrived, but, um, I'm fascinated by it. What were the structures like there and, and are there earth mounds? I assume, I assume there would be. They are earth mounds, uh, by volume. The largest mound, Monk's Mound, is by volume larger than the Great Pyramids at Giza. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, it's not as tall. Um, it's only about, I want to say, 100 feet tall. But I say only until you actually go there and you walk up the steps. They've installed steps there. Um, and you walk up the side of the mound and you are looking over what's called the American Bottom, just this flat, uh, you know, floodable riverine area. Uh, and floodplain of the Mississippi, and you just see for miles. I mean, you can imagine, and then you can imagine they even have a VR thing that you can actually hook yourself up to and see what uh, the city looked like to our best guess, um, you know, about a thousand years ago. So, yeah, I mean, it towers. And there's some other bigger mounds. There's, you know, I think over 120 mounds. And then you consider also that we've destroyed most of the site. Um, like there are houses right around the edge of the site. There's a highway running directly through it. You, you kind of, it's mind boggling. And then you realize St. Louis 
lies on potentially what was a, even a larger site. We just have no way of knowing. Well, how do you how do you imagine? So I, I always picture this. Okay, let me start over. Do, do you imagine Cahokia and these other places being almost like a continuation or spillover out of Mexico and Mesoamerica, where you had these enormous population centers and domestication centers as well? Of course, you know, um, and and it's sort of like uh, cities spill out from Mexico City right up into the U.S. and sort of along the Mississippi. Or is this like a completely unrelated thing in your mind? Um, are is there? you know, trade networks between these cities and such. How do you envision all of this? You know, I am not an expert in this, but I would say just from, you know, my own personal point of view that there was trade. Now that's either step-by-step trade or potentially direct, you know, step-by-step trade is you trade to your neighbor, they trade to their neighbor and it gets to you. Um, Or it could have been direct. Um, I would be very interested to read more about that. And, I bet Gail Fritz, well, Dr. Fritz, will know more about that um, when you have her on, the author of Feeding Cahokia. Um, but yeah, I mean, you find you find obsidian from the Pacific Northwest. You find shells from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you find, you know, from all corners of the continent and, and further south, you know, Mexico, the Caribbean, you find all of that at Cahokia and similar sites around the Southeast. It's just amazing that this was going on here and, and somehow this has been obfuscated or overlooked somehow, you know, this idea that it was just the, you know, the bands of savages and that was it, you know, but then in reality there was uh, what, 500 plus nations, some pretty advanced city States, um, huge trade networks, you know, I mean, I know that stone here from uh, Maine is found all the way down to Florida. You know, so you're talking about <laughs> yeah. incredible trade networks. So, you know, the uh, it's just like how have we somehow overlooked it, and just still the average person imagines that it was just sort of these like ragtag bands of people here in North America, <laughs> and does not realize the degree to which this place was not just sort of civilized, but like um, the the degree of the sophistication that was taking place here. Yeah, I think when you look at it through the lens of there was a reason, you know, there's a reason for that because you think though, in, intentional, like 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 a like a big mound, for instance, like unlike a stone pyramid, a big mound getting rained on, growing over, getting being abandoned. It's not long before it looks like a hill. You know, and maybe you don't realize. Yeah, I think the first, I think the first guy that got to Cahokia, his his, I can't quote him exactly, but it was something to the effect of, "This looks like it was a city," <laughs> and it, that was, you know, that was before any restoration. He was just, you know, uh, canoeing along a river, got there, and was like, "Wow, this was a city, huh?" So he he was aware um, of that, and when you see other sites like Poverty Point. Um, or you see the Pueblos out in the Southwest, um, you, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a sense of this is human. Um, so I, I think there was a vested interest, just like, I mean, to make a microcosm of it um, and not to cast shade on farmers, but, you know, oftentimes you would get land and, you know, especially in that area, there would be say a mound on it. And before the, before NAGPRA, the, Uh, North American Graves Protection Act uh, or Native American Graves Protection Act was signed, you, there was no reason that you couldn't destroy and level a mound, a burial mound or a ceremonial mound on your land. Um, And you had a vested interest in doing that because, you know, imagine say, you know, it's like if an illegal entity wants to come in and dig on that land, they could take several acres or more from you. Um, if they find that mound. So you don't want them to do that. So you destroy the mound. That's a microcosm of it. I think that is also what happened on a large scale. Otherwise, Um, don't get me wrong. There's always been people who have, you know, wanted to preserve sites um, and wanted to help their fellow man. But, you know, that's not always who takes the field. (laughs) Man, it's just, (laughs) we're talking again, I know this is not your area of expertise. I'll get us back on track here in a minute, but do you envision this as being like a hybrid model of, because there's obviously agriculture taking place, but not kind of the, the, the type that we think of often, 
right? So I don't, you know, how do you envision this? Is it like there's a suite of plants that are grown, um, but also there's a lot of wild food, right? I imagine um, not like we're seeing livestock, right? So it's it's like suite of plants plus foraging plus hunting fishing is how they're feeding these cities. I mean, it just the idea of feeding a city that big is like how can you do that off of the wild landscape, you know, even with a yeah, suite, of, under- suite of plants that you grow. Yeah, that's my understanding that it was a combination of um, agriculture. I definitely think it moves beyond, you know, your horticulture, which people have, you know, hunter gatherers, you know, we say 10,000 years ago was like the agricultural revolution, but I would, I would uh, eat my hat if (laughs) um, hunter gatherers weren't participating in some sort of um, horticulture, you know, near the home or selecting for certain trees that they didn't cut down for firewood, you know, okay, we're going to keep that date palm or we're going to, you know, we're going to keep that wild plum tree there, but, you know, we're going to cut down other things for firewood because we realize that we can tend this and get food. Uh, I know Cahokia, they did have, um, they were harvesting wild plums um, and they were harvesting a relative of the tomato, the black nightshade that people think is toxic. It's not Um, just make sure identification is correct. But, um, so we do find those seeds everywhere. And again, Gail, you know, she specializes in this. So you're in for a treat. She's great. She sent me some seeds actually that I read the book and I was fascinated and I emailed her and I said, Hey, do you have any, um, may grass seeds? Um, I'd be really curious in, to, to grow that. And she sent me her last, the last she- seeds she had, and they were from 2016 and, um, they germinated right away and grew in my garden up here. Um, outside of their natural range. It was great. Tell, um, tell me about maygrass. I don't know anything about it. Oh, maygrass is one of the Eastern agricultural complex plants. Um, it, it's really cool in that it's ready in May. So it produces a grain oh, that you wow. can grind down or into a porridge in, in the late May. Spring. So, <laughs> yeah. So you're getting food right away. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, localized really around, you know, Missouri and then down into Texas. Yeah. So it, doesn't make its way up here, but it grows just fine up here. Isn't it funny is when you're a forager weird. and then you've got this anthropology background? So, you, you know, you've got a pretty good sense of food history. And and then you see these fad diets like where you shouldn't eat grains at all. And it's like, dude, hang on. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait a second. Like, what are you talking about? Because people have always eaten grass seeds. In fact, they're like a really great food. Like, should, should we live exclusively on like, you know, irradiated dwarf wheat the flour no but like you know the idea that we wouldn't you know wild rice for instance or you know like you're saying the may grass like these grains are not just good for you they are so important to people and the idea that like we didn't used to eat them it's just oh man it's mind-numbing to me i'm sure you you yeah the fad diets kind of strike me as um like an animal in captivity kind of pacing its cage you know (laughs) kind of getting like stir crazy We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first, hunting is as ancient as humanity itself. And through most of our history, it wasn't just about the physical pursuit, it was a spiritual one too. One of the ways human beings came to understand ourselves and our place in the wild world that sustained us. Hunting is still an incredible tool for personal transformation today, helping you discover more about yourself, your environment, the animals you share the world with, and even helping you develop a deeper understanding of life and death itself. Hunting can help you find your place in the community of life. But you could hunt all your life and never find that kind of transformation. It takes deliberate practice, awareness, and sometimes even initiation. That's why my friend Monsel Denton created Sacred Hunting. Sacred Hunting brings new or even experienced hunters out onto the landscape to stock, harvest, and field dress animals in a retreat-type setting in conjunction with sweat lodges, entheogenic plant medicine ceremonies, and strong intention setting that prepares hunters for a lifelong spiritual relationship with themselves, the land, and the animals they hunt. If you want to hunt as a tool for transformation check out sacredhunting.com. Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts and more experienced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe. 
There's only a few spots available on each hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available if you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fed podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and learn more about Monsel and Sacred Hunting on episode 59 of the Wild Fed podcast. Now, back to the show. Yeah. You know, like it's in absence of, you know, having to really get our food other than exchanging money at the grocery store or, um, you know, going to a restaurant, uh, we've kind of overthought. We have too much time to think about our food um, and we think about it not in the right ways. So really, we don't think about our food enough at the same time, oddly. Um, so, yeah, I think those fat, I mean, the fad diets... I don't even know what to say about them, really. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm reading a book right now. It's called Eating to Extinction, and and he's talking about him in the beginning of the book is on wild food. So he's talking about the number of foods eaten in you know by different cultures around the world that are hunter gatherers, and he he's talking about the Hadza at one point eating 800 foods a year, uh, 800 species a year, I should say. Whereas I think you know here we're eating something like 30 species a year on average. And so what's funny about the fad diets is they're just reinterpretations of those same 30 foods. It's hilarious to me. It's like you take, it's like a reshuffling all the time. So it's like as if you had 30 playing cards and you keep reshuffling them and you're like, here's a new diet. And you're like, no, same 30 foods. Or like, oh, so now you can only have 25 foods or 20 foods. <laughs> but that's like, it's hilarious to me because uh, rather than thinking broader, because we need to go the opposite direction. Everybody's trying to cut things out all the time. It's like, hey, you need way more, <laughs> you know, like you need more genetics in your diet. You need a broader suite of nutrients and you, your lonely ass needs to meet some more species because 30, <laughs> 30, <laughs> well said. 30 yeah, is like, for sure. you don't know very many other cr like earthlings. Like, hey, welcome to Earth. There's all these Earthlings. You can get to know some of them, <laughs> you know, like you should. It's good to That's do. That's a really cool way of thinking about that. I, I haven't thought about it like that before. Yeah. You know, I'm just... We I'm are lonely. Very yeah. lonely as a species right now. It's kind of sad, you know, turning in on ourselves so much, like shut-ins, I think of it, you know. Um, one of the things that I really like that you do, I've appreciated this about you for a long time because... Besides you and I, I and I'm sure I, there's a lots of other people too, but in, in the foraging scene that I sort of am aware of, I, I feel like there's this category that gets left out all the time and that's eating insects, you know? And I, I've i like pushed on that button a bunch of times and I get, um, I get a pretty mixed bag of responses. So, you know, I did an episode this year of uh, the Wild Fed TV show on cicadas, you know, because we went down for that 17 year, har you know, uh, hatch of the brood 10. Um, I've grasshoppers have been a big one for me, dragonflies, June bugs. But well, you do some as well. And some that I've, I remember the first time I saw you doing it was um, Japanese beetles. And I was just like, re like, I remember I was like, oh, that's gross. <laughs> and then I was like, wait a second, dude, what are you doing? That's awesome. So anyway, I wanted to give you a minute to talk about that because when we start talking about ancient peoples, ancient diets, this is absolutely the norm. And this time in history now where we're not eating insects, we're not practicing entomophagy is that's the unusual piece, right? So um, yeah, just wonder if you could give us some context about some of the experimentations you've done and, and how you sort of look at that aspect of foraging. You're absolutely right that it's not the norm for us to not eat insects. Um, and actually, we are eating insects still, even <laughs> people who think that they're not. I mean, if you look at the FDA regulations, there are limits to the amount of, you know, flies, wings, legs, um, maggots or whatever um, that are allowed in your chocolate, tomato sauce, peanut butter, etc. And those limits are not zero you'd almost say so there's they are there, higher you, than zero you could almost word it like there's <laughs> provisions for some insects <laughs> it'd be another way to say oh that, yeah you know yeah you are still participating in the great um human story of entomophagy even if you don't want to or don't know it <laughs> um but yeah i definitely eat japanese beetles they are delicious i will say it started from revenge uh as many good <laughs> stories start from a sense of vengeance is mm -hmm. an epic tale but they were annihilating um, my garden um and they were attacking 
like some cherry trees that I was harvesting from in a park and some wild plums I was harvesting from. And they were just totally denuding the foliage of these trees and really making these trees struggle. And so um, I had to do something once I found out, you know, and I looked at this Facebook group. Um, it was like a, it was like a bug eating group from Missouri. They've since closed down or changed their name, but they, I asked them, I was like, are Japanese beetles edible? Because they had posted something about, you know, you know, these other beetles being edible. And I saw that they were related. So they said, yep, they are. So I immediately went to town. Um, they're super easy to harvest. Can you tell um, me about that? Because when I've thought about it, you know, those, uh, those yellow bag traps that people use, um, they must have yeah. some chemical pheromone or something that attracts them. And those bags just fill up with them. And I've been like, man, is there a way to do that without a toxic chemical? Or are you just hand gathering <laughs> them? You know, I hand gather them, but I have never actually used the traps. Uh, mostly out of the sense that it'll bring more Japanese beetles to my <laughs> to yard, which area. is what I hear. Plus there's, yeah, I'm which sure is what there's I hear something in, in there that's not food that, you, you know, but uh, just curious. Right. Yeah. Like I'm not sure what's all in it. Um, I don't think the pheromones would hurt, but I also, I don't know if it's, I'm pheromones. not sure. I'm just guessing. I, I would think of course you wouldn't want to do that for food, but I was wondering if you had some other way to aggregate them or it was just like one at a time. Yeah, I mean, I was actually thinking of trying the bag traps this year, but I'm not sure how open, you know, the companies are even right. obligated to be about what's probably, in there. So I, I would look around, but yeah, I actually just go with a mason jar, a wide mouth mason jar with about an inch of water on the bottom and I and a, a lid. And I will just go out to my best spots are like anywhere with like wild grapevines or Virginia creeper. They love these edge spaces. That could also just be that, I'm in Minneapolis and typically our edge spaces with the most foliage are taken over by vines or these like quote unquote weedy species. So that could just be coincidence. I'm not sure what they prioritize when they eat, but um, yeah, I'll go to these spaces and then the Japanese beetles, when you frighten them, their immediate escape plan is using gravity. So they will, they don't fly away. Some do, I would say like 1% of Japanese beetles will choose the fly away route and I think I'm naturally selecting for those in my area uh, because they don't, <laughs> they don't get eaten. Uh, but all the other ones will just tuck their legs in and r- become this hard little ball and roll off the leaf. And that's their way to escape. However, these ones don't escape. They fall right into my jar of water. Once they're in there, um, they're like crabs in a bucket. They hold each other down. So you don't actually have to have the lid on or anything. You just have it in your pocket. The water Once there? you're done, uh, that just makes it so they float and pull each other into the water okay they're not drowning uh, makes it so though. they can't get purchased uh they they eventually drown but um they actually are still alive um you know like the next day when i put them if i just put them in the refrigerator or i put them in the freezer some are still alive the next day but yeah so you harvest them and then um you take them home and you know cool them down somehow the fridge is fine it'll take a little bit longer that's usually overnight, but a freezer, you know, maybe an hour or two, you've, you've sent them into a dormant state, like a torpor, and they are no longer aware of their surroundings. And so then when you do the next step, I find it to not be as cruel. Um, but yeah, then you boil them oh, right yeah. away. Are you, so. are you trying to remove anything when you boil them or, you know, it's not, is it like a leech or that's just the way you've cooked them? I think this is the way I've cooked them. I mean, bringing them up to a boil for even a minute or two is supposed to kill bacteria. Ah, yeah, sure. um, I'm not sure how effective it is, but I've also never had a problem with it. Okay. Cause I typically dry roast the insects I've worked with. So I'm kind of wondering if that's a, a necessary step or just an alternative cooking method. They're so pretty too. I, I find that, um, you know, there's that part of us that's been, you know, trained to see insects and bugs as, as dirty. So we often don't take the time to appreciate, but that iridescence that they have they're like little scarabs yeah and i think they're so yeah for sure when i call them so if i call them japanese beetles people i have a distinct ick factor um but when i call them edible scarabs Ah. people are like oh heck yeah no they're hearkening back to that like egyptology phase we all somehow had when we were kids um and they're excited so there's marketing (laughs) yeah that's awesome (laughs) Because I noticed too, I was looking on your uh, website, you had a, an ice cream recipe with black ants in there, um, which I, man, first of all, I love the flavor of ants, that intensely lemony flavor that they have, um, oh, yeah. which I imagine is probably formic acid, but 
I really love this. And I also find that the genus Hymenoptera, or not genus, but the, is that a family? Hymenoptera? That'd be what? I think that's a family level. Yeah, yeah. family level. So bees, wasps, you know, ants, they don't have the same ick factor for me that a lot of other critters do. There, there's something about them. I don't know if it's their social organization, the sophistication of them, but they, they don't, I don't think people get as skeeved out eating a bee as they do, you know, a lot like say an earthworm or something. But uh, anyway. Oh yeah. I'm one of those people that can't really eat the earthworm. Yeah. I can't go. Pretty there. Gross. Really, it's not really <laughs> exciting to me. I mean, you know, it depends on no. how hungry I am, but, um, but ants are fantastic, man. So I was wondering if you could speak to that too. And then sort of like how you've, what kind of experiences you've had collecting them. Yeah, these ants had so these ants that I used at the uh, in the snow cream recipe, ice cream made from snow, freshly fallen snow. Um, those actually I did purchase, um, and those seem to be from Australia, um, just because it was winter and I didn't really have access to any ants on hand. Um, my ant season actually starts when sugar bush starts. So when you're out there splitting wood, you'll oftentimes you know split a log, and there will be an ant colony inside of it, um, pretty good size ones too, and then the then you have ants. Um, but yeah, they tasted, these ones were less lemony, actually. They were more like a wild grape flavor or like oh, neat. a wild grape leaf okay. flavor. Huh. Yeah, they're pretty good. Um, wow. Yeah, sometimes yeah. I'll see them swarming, you know, I don't know if that's what it's called, but when they, you know, you'll get all the ants will come out at the same time. And I've sometimes scooped them into like a five gallon bucket and then you get, I get all the sand and debris, everything just kind of goes in. But then when I sift the bucket up, they all start to climb away from all the debris. They, they sift themselves out of it, you know, and then I can kind of scoop them off individually. That's um, teamwork. That's yeah, teamwork yeah right they, they really, they really <laughs> help Thanks, with guys. it. But yeah, I really like, uh, I like eating ants. I like eating uh, bees, things like that. But uh, curious too, I think I saw you did a post on, it must have been grasshoppers. And I think you were talking about, you know, the tradition that's still, I mean, still go to like a real traditional Mexican restaurant. You can often find them. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, curious if that's something you've messed with or is that something you've just kind of done at the the restaurant level or something? It's on my bucket list to go down to Oaxaca, Mexico and participate in the Chapulines harvest. Um, I think it's in May, uh, every year, at least around that time. That's when you're, you get the most fresh ones. Um, yeah, I mean, other than them just being delicious and it's, you know, Chapulines isn't even a Spanish word. It's a, it's a Aztec word or Nahuatl. That's all awesome. I believe. Don't quote yeah. me on that though. Wow, but that's cool. It's definitely not a Spanish word. So I'm not sure if it's a, like a Mixtec or, you know, uh, I do really like pre-Columbian, uh, like studying that time, but I'm not an expert in it. I can always learn more. Uh, but yeah, I would love to go down there. I mean, their food culture is so amazing. They're also, I mean, one of the world centers for like mushroom diversity. No kidding. Um, so going down there and mushroom hunting, and mushroom hunting is a huge down there. And they also eat like certain kinds of slime molds that aren't related to fungi. And they're like some of the only places on the planet, or at least that I know of that eat slime molds too. So, I mean, what a fascinating place. Yeah, they also, the Aztecs were messing with spirulina too, right? It's like that idea of spirulina that, you know, the now the algal health food, the blue green algae is, is actually comes out of uh, Mexico as well. It's fascinating to me in Peru. I never really found out what the species was, but I was um, in Cusco in the markets. I would see a, um, an algae that was like little spheres, like little gel spheres, some like almost as big as a marble, some like the size of a BB. They come in these random sizes. And I remember always thinking like the, it was some kind of late algal bloom that was in the lakes. And just that's really neat to me when people mess with uh, algae and fungi that we wouldn't normally see as food. So that's really cool. Can you speak to the mushroom thing a little bit? That's a big part of your um, kind of foraging background is is in the mycological world, right? Yeah, it is. I just finished um, two years as the president of the Minnesota Mycological Society. Um, So mushrooms, I've been harvesting them since about 2014. Um, I mean, they're fascinating. I think a lot of people's entry point into foraging is increasingly going to be mushrooms instead of plants. Um, You have a lot of popular figures right now making mushroom hunting, you know, getting enthusiastic fans of it. as far as, you know, the mushroom diversity in Mexico, so many better people to talk to <laughs> about it. Um, I will say, though, you know, in here in the Midwest, we have an intense amount of mushroom diversity. I know the North American Mycological Society, uh, sorry, the North American Mycological Association, uh, NAMA, 
they have a an annual foray where all the members get together at some place in the United States and go out and hunt for mushrooms. And by far the most species they've ever found was when they had it in Wisconsin. Um, hundreds of species. I mean, they blew away by double, I think the next closest, uh, you know, foray that they've had. So I'm really lucky to live here. Maybe that's why the Midwest has so many foragers, um, is maybe that's why that, sure. that area you're in seriously is like, I mean, some of the best and brightest are there, you know, yourself included all doing this work right in that oh. little zone. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm always fascinated cause it's like, you know, until it's just, it's like, why, why there, you know, why this Minnesota, Wisconsin area, but it is, it is dense out there. Um, how do you feel about, um, what we're seeing in, you know, the mushroom foraging now, particularly as it, you know, the commercial components, probably most on people's radar as, um, this really fast growing sec- segment of the, um, culinary world. Um, you know, we're starting to see some like certifications and regulations and, um, you know, I just curious how you see it big picture. Is this something you feel is really positive, kind of negative? Uh, are you neutral on it? And do you think, um, you know, I think people often cite studies that talk about how, uh, you know, it's kind of impossible to really at the foraging level do harm to mushroom populations in most cases, um, with taking fruit bodies, but just curious, you know, big picture, how you, how you see all that. And do you agree with that stuff? Yeah. Specifically in terms of mushrooms. Yeah, specifically on mushrooms. Like, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm curious how you feel about that with plants too, but but mushrooms in particular, given the work you've done with the Mycological Society there. Yeah, it's my understanding that, you know, actually harvesting mushrooms um, doesn't really affect populations at all. It's it's like, does harvesting apples from an apple tree hurt the tree? Not unless you're doing it uh, like an insane way. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about mushrooms, they are the fruiting body of the mycelium, the mycelium is either in the wood or the ground, um, that this mushroom's coming out of. So, I mean, there are some studies, there was like a longitudinal study that lasted 29 years. I want to say it was in Switzerland that they picked every chanterelle mushroom in half of a forest and the other half they picked none. Um, and they found that the, actually the side that they picked had a slightly more, but statistically significant, um, increase in, in mass that they were able to harvest from it. So the side that was picked, uh, I think, yeah, the side that was picked yeah. actually, so, you know, so I think it stimulated more. the growth yeah. more. So let, and let me add, I want to just add something to what you said. If I were to take every apple off the apple tree year after year after year, and I carry those away, one downside that I can see is distribution of the seeds. Uh, because we're not, you know, as foragers, we're not often like eating them and then, you know, squatting over there and and letting some of those seeds <laughs> back into the ground right we're putting them into septic tanks that get carted off somewhere so oh, sure. but with your mushrooms you're you know with these air dispersed spores you're basically as you pick you are carry and carry them around with you you are kind of in a, in a sense distributing them better than they might even if they had just stayed there on the ground or would you agree with that anyway yeah far better i mean e- when you think of a mushroom releasing its spores, which it does from the underside of itself, um, in most basidiomycetes, uh, you know, some some mushrooms don't distribute it from underneath themselves. Like, you know, your giant puffball morels, they have their own spore dispersal that's different than, say, like your white button mushroom or your chanterelles. But um, just raise, like most of their spores fall directly underneath them you know they uh, rely on wind to be dispersed and you can't really catch a current as well from you know a couple inches above the ground so when you pick up that mushroom even to just look at it and think huh you're a marvelous creature what are you that mushroom is busy at the moment if it's mature spreading its spores uh, to a degree that it could never have hoped for. So um, that's in keeping line with, I mean, my belief that foraging, the actual practice, is inherently sustainable and regenerative. So if, you're, if your foraging is not sustainable and regenerative, it's actually not foraging. I would call it poaching um, <laughs> or some cool. other word, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> foraging is, is a coherent practice that, that does involve giving back more than you take. Man, I've never heard anyone actually say that. Um, I really appreciate that distinction because, I, again, given the popularity, the rise in popularity that we're seeing, 
at a time where there's just so many human bodies on the landscape and generally, uh, you know, I think it's important that we have distinctions like that. So, and also I, I want to say like a lot of us who are gathering them, you know, we're going to have maybe a, a wooden basket. So spores are just kind of pouring through those, right. And picking totally. up on, on yeah, wind currents, but also kind of like electrostatic, right. They ride electrical currents a little bit too in the air. Like it's not just, is it just pure wind? I think so. You know, there's, they're so small um, that I think forces behave slightly different. Um, at least according, you know, I read Peter McCoy's uh, radical mycology and he talked about a section in there um, about how water even behaves differently in mycelium. Now, whether that's true, I'm not a hydrologist or if that's even what someone who studies water is called. But uh, I'd imagine that electricity also, you know, could act differently on sense, something so small. What? How do you? How do you feel now if we if we take this conversation out to the plant level? Um, and what are your thoughts about foraging? Uh, you know, the plant foraging boom that we're seeing today. Um, and then I guess probably you know to add distinctions to that too. It's like there's native plants, there's um, non-native species, um, there's deleterious invasive species. So we got kind of that whole that's broad enough, but then, you know, all, the, all this pressure on the landscape plants behave, you know, and have different natural histories than, than fungi. So yeah. How do you feel about that? And do you think this is something we can sustain, uh, or can create systems to regulate? It's a great question. I think, I think much like Sam, I believe that more people should forage and that the more people foraging, the better. Now, again, inherent in that, in my understanding of that is the word foraging and what it actually means. Now, I don't mean, you know, people harvesting willy nilly, I think. And I also think most of the damage that's done to, um, you know, foraging areas is trampling more so than actual picking. Um, I know at least here in Minnesota, we have a lot of, um, of our native plants they need this like top kind of duff layer, this like loamy, soft layer that isn't compacted in order to grow. Um, and when you walk in an area, even if you think like, okay, you know, I'm only harvesting, you know, 10%, although I hate, I really don't like the, um, yeah. like the percentage rules mm -hmm. of taking things. Cause it, it, how would you even say this? If I was talking about people, I would say dehumanize, but you, yeah, yeah you kind of look at an area and you don't take it for what it is. Right. Yeah. So you just it like, cold, hard math, apply. You mean, or? yeah, cold, hard math. And this reductionism that doesn't actually acknowledge that this is like, it does acknowledge the ecosystem and how things are connected and what you're actually looking at. You just go in with a mindset and you stick to it. Right. Like I'm going to take no more than 10% mm -hmm. and you think you're good for that, but you m might not be and likely aren't. Um, and there's the tragedy of the commons there. It's like, are you the first person to yeah. take 10% or are you taking the second 10% <laughs> right. after somebody else is taking 10%? Yeah. In Minneapolis, it's like, are you taking the hundred, are you the hundredth person yeah. or the thousandth right, person right. to, you know, take your cut of flesh from this area? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think more people should be foraging because then more people would have a connection. That's actually a huge reason why I started teaching. You know, I love exposing people to new flavors um, and then get th getting them closer to their food. Uh, also the, the emotional benefits of being in the woods or even just a green space, being surrounded by the color green itself uh, does the heart good, you know, lowers cortisol levels. Cause we're, you know, and the human eye is meant to see more colors in the green uh, section than any other color. We're, we're made to distinguish between greens That's and we love so it. so awesome, right? Uh, yeah. I see a huge benefit to p putting people in contact with quote unquote nature, um, plants and mushrooms, trees, berries, nuts, because when you have that connection, it's deeply powerful. You will change your life and you will do your part to change the world for the better. Um, once you have this relate these relationships, I mean, you do make friends. Um, when you know your earlier comment that it's lonely <laughs> eating only thirty plants, and that all these other organisms on the planet that we don't know or don't have a relationship with, they're surrounding us all the time, and we kind of just go from birth to death without learning only a handful of them. You know, um, I think it's deeply healing for a lot of people, especially in an urban setting, to 
to make those connections and to change their life in that way. How, what do you think though? Like, so I agree with you. And then you, you could also go out as somebody who you were just going to do some birding, let's say, and you're making a connection with species and you're out in those places and you're getting all that green and you get the lower cortisol and all of that, but there's no food component. And could we go a layer deeper because you and I are both interested in the food piece. So it's not just meeting these creatures, but it's eating these creatures as well. And, uh, and that has, at least in my experience, somehow that seems to impact people at a much more, well, yeah, visceral level. I mean, viscera, it's like, I mean, it's the, I mean, food is the greatest Trojan horse for knowledge. I mean, I mean, from, we know even from say a kindergarten days, you know, that food is a huge motivator. Uh, if you're given a piece of candy to do something, you've been bought and paid for, you know, (laughs) as a child. And to some, I mean, that continues to this day. I mean, if someone offers me a burrito to do something, uh, to like help them move or something, that's only 10 bucks and they get me for a day, you know, (laughs) because burritos are delicious. (laughs) Um, So nestling this knowledge and understanding uh, with food as kind of the carrot on the stick, uh, there's something to that. I mean, there's something intuitive there. Humans love food. Surprise. And we got to eat, we have to eat something every day, right? So it's like, if you have to eat every day and, you know, because like, you know, you and I both love doing this stuff, but we do live in a built environment. So we are eating a lot of foods that aren't coming from these wild systems like this. It's like, whenever I get the opportunity to make some part of myself out of some wild creature, I feel like it, it, makes me, I don't know what's the word. It's like, I feel more, yeah, part of the landscape. It's just different. It feels transcendent to me. Like that's how I, I think that's my biggest source of transcendence actually is, you know, being around these plants, tasting them, learning about them, you know, eating something at the peak of ripeness that money could not buy this experience. Yes. Money can't buy almost anything that foragers do. What are some of the species that you're most excited about and maybe even some that um, aren't as popular uh, that you think would be if people knew about them? That's a fantastic question. I like that it's not what's your favorite thing to forage because that's like trying to choose which child to save from the burning house. (laughs) Yeah, Um, right. You know, because it's like, they're all great. What are you talking about? Um, I would say... You know, one thing I like to highlight is the butternut. Do you guys have that walnut? I don't there? see so many of them. I see more black walnut here, but uh, but whenever I find a white walnut, I'm all over that thing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean they've they they're probably going to go extinct in our lifetime. Are they really? Um, they've already decreased uh, over ninety nine percent since oh, I want to say nineteen seventy six is that. when they like just since then. You know, they've decreased over 99%. And why? Their population. Oh, so there's, um, oh, what is that fungus? There's a fungus that, much like, okay. you know, it's the same story. Like the you elm know? or like you know? our beach. Yeah, beach. the elm or the American chestnut or um, the, you know, emerald ash borer that has fungi associated with it that makes it so mm-hmm. deadly to ash trees. Oh, um, the butternut has a root rot fungi that. It has that the butternut has shown no immunity to across its population. Um, there's no treatment either, so you can't like inject it with something, um, and it's, it's just killing them all. So I, I do say that the butternut is uh, the species I most like to highlight because and why. So first of all, its nut is delicious. It tastes like kind of like a banana cream is what I get. Yeah. And it's a lightly, you know, it's a very buttery walnut. Go figure. Uh, these names oftentimes hold knowledge. <laughs> um, so I do suggest that people, in a, you know, in accordance with like best practices that they can learn from maybe the nursery they get the tree from or their state DNR, uh, you should try to plant it on your land. Um, because if we can keep these genetics limping along, you know, your tree might not become an adult tree that's capable of producing nuts. But if we can keep these genetics alive and keep people seeing a butternut tree, touching a butternut tree, whether that's just to read a book under its shade or, you know, fingers crossed, be able to taste one of those delicious walnuts, we can make it so that that unique expression of the language of the universe, which is its actuality, it's this tree 
we can keep that alive long enough for people to care about it again, much like they do the American chestnut. Um, and we know that there's a multidisciplinary um, effort to bring back the American chestnut in some form. And I think eventually we can do that for the butternut. But we got to keep them going. Like you said, limping along. And yeah. man, there was three uh, sexually mature butternuts in, downtown where I live um, in between two buildings. And <laughs> last year, man, they cut them all down and paved it. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was so. I try to have you know. It's like I have to like tap into compassion because it's like they had. They, it's not like they're malicious. I have had people cut down trees that they saw me forage from that I feel they did that just because they didn't want someone picking from them. You know, so like I lost uh, several several apple trees a couple of years ago that were at the cemetery. Uh, be, I think people just hated the idea that I'd stop and pick apples there. So like they just cut them down. But with these butternuts, it was just somebody. Th- think you know wall of green i don't know whatever those trees are we're put in the parking lot but it was so sad because they're the only trees that i knew in this area oh so. that's that is sad and and that those apple trees are sad too i mean at a cemetery what better testament to um the living memory is it of not a beautiful metaphor these like, people yeah yeah i know man and the, <laughs> the idea to me it's like if i gave you a money machine and you just like had to just all you had to do was just make sure it but I don't even know what got enough sun and it just produced money. It's like the idea you would destroy that thing. So it's like, Hey, you have a, you have basically like a food producing machine here and it's just pumping out fruit every year and you're going to cut it down. Like, but why would you do that? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me, but you know, people get weird about this stuff, you know? All right. So butter. Yeah. And then you go ahead. Oh, and then you'll uh, you'll gladly ship in those same apples from yeah, you know fifteen hundred miles away that are not that are mealy and not as nearly as mealy good. and not ripe when they're picked. Yeah, and, yeah exactly. Just, they're on the cusp of molding. You know, yeah, questionable practices. Who knows what? Yeah, I know. And they're yeah. cloned. I mean, just it's hilarious. But uh, yeah, what are, besides butternut, you got any others that you'd want to highlight? Um, species that you think uh, people listening who who are who are foraging already and who are like you know, looking for new stuff, uh, that they can, you know, they can meet and eat like, uh, anything else come to mind? Oh gosh. Um, there's so much left out there for me to discover, especially since I'm, I'm going to start traveling more for oh, foraging yeah. Uh, outside, cool. yeah, outside of the upper Midwest. So okay. Sam and I might be taking a trip down to Texas right at the end of this month or maybe the beginning in May. So that'll be cool. Um, but I would probably say something, you know, seemingly mundane to me, but I feel like it gets a bad rap. Uh, and it's a mushroom called pheasant back. Yeah. It's dryad yeah, saddle is another name for it. Dryad saddle. Yeah. And nonatus, uh, na- no, sorry, cereoporus squamosus. That's now, um, man. Or that's not, you know, for, for us, it's another month or so, but that's a springtime mushroom. Yeah, for sure. I see people already finding them down south um, to an extent. Yeah, I probably have another month to go here, which is sad to think about. But uh, yeah, that's an amazing mushroom that fruits prodigiously. It's regarded as a consolation prize to the morel hunt every year. But I think it's, you know, I like it better for many reasons um, than, than morels. the morel mushroom. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, those are fighting words. <laughs> they are. And I'm I'm glad to lose the fight over the morel spot if I can have the pheasant bag spot. All right. So Wait, let, walk me they're easy it. to find. Okay. Yeah. Walk me through. Yeah. They're, oh, they're go ahead. S- yeah. Yeah, they're really easy to find. Um, they grow out of wood, so they're typically above, you know, the soil level. You don't have to, like, drive yourself mad thinking your eyes just aren't seeing these camouflaged morels. So you have these big shelf-like mushrooms that, you know, have a feathery-like appearance on top and a cream-colored underside with many little pores. Um, they also, you can pick, oh gosh, 30, 50 pounds of pheasant back. Um, if you can use that all and I I mean, in a matter of 30 minutes, hour and a half tops, um, they're so abundant and they also fruit from spring, uh, and then even into fall, if you can, um, get the right conditions. So like people typically harvest them at the wrong time. And that's why they get a lot of like mediocre ratings from, you know, guidebooks and websites is because if you look underneath um, this mushroom and you look at the pores, you want to barely be able to see them. You should almost have a seemingly uniform cream colored surface with the pores just being itsy bitsy. Now, when those get bigger, say you can fit the tip of a pencil 
comfortably inside each pore, you're starting to look at toughness now. And that's what people typically say. They say, oh, this mushroom's even inedible because it's so tough. Well, that just means, I mean, if you harvested a, um, like a green banana and you tried to eat it like a yellow or like a freckled banana, you're not going to have the experience you thought you were going to have. So connecting to your food in this way, which there is nobody between you and your food when you forage, you know? So you do have to have that knowledge and that, that, that instinct. And if you have that with pheasant backs, you have a delicious mushroom that's easy to find and incredibly abundant. The smell of that mushroom is like watermelon. It's so good. It yeah. smells like watermelon rind to me. I mean, it's incredible. But you're right. Like, um, if you're even just a little late, it's like kind of inedibly tough, or you're just using the margins of it in order to get something soft enough to eat. And I think, you know, sometimes if it's like you want to go out knowing that's what you're looking for versus stumbling upon it because you typically find it a little bit late, but you'll find it in big flushes, like you were saying. I mean, and it is really pretty. I do feel like it's a little bit underrepresented as an edible mushroom. And, you know, like the idea of being able to find it in the spring is really cool, man. You just got me kind of pump pumped about it because I wasn't really thinking about it this year. Um, because, you know, another thing about it is it's it's growing at a time where there's just not a lot of foliage to, uh, you know, obscure it. So it's like easy to find in that way, right? Oh, yeah. You can just stand on the edge of a floodplain or a creek and just look down either, you know, either way, look both ways. Mm -hmm. And if it's out there, you pretty much be able to see it. Yeah. So easy. It couldn't be easier. I've been, uh, you know, one of the crossover things from hunting for me has been to bring my binoculars when I'm (laughs) doing a lot of foraging because (laughs) they're so helpful actually. So I've thought about doing that, but I haven't actually done it. I mean, does it work as good as I feel like it? When I go out work? for chaga now, again, like I, I, I love cross modality stuff. So like I've adapted, like when I go out chaga hunting now, I'll bring climbing sticks that are used to get into tree stands, you know, so like that are easily strapped to a tree. So now I've got these little lightweight ladders and I'll bring my binoculars because, you know, like when you're looking for chaga, it's like uh, the number of times you see like let's say a big paper birch and the the bark is peeling back and it's catching the light just right that it casts a shadow and it looks like a huge chaga and you walk 150 yards through the woods and you get to it and you're like, oh, it's just bark. So like I can pick that stuff out now with my binoculars and save myself those like little forays and stay focused on the trail. So yeah, it actually can be pretty handy. I mean, maybe it's cumbersome for some, but I always have like a little chest harness. So, you know, they're easy to carry, but I'm going to go looking for- That would save me. I'm actually right. Because- Go ahead. Oh, typically, you know, in the city, when I'm, when I see what I think is a mushroom, you know, in the distance, it's always like a golf ball. Yeah, or a piece of trash or <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Man, I really love you do that urban foraging thing. I think it's so helpful for people to, to break down the, like, um, I guess the really stark contrast between this is urban and this is, you know, wildness. And it's like, Hey, they merge here and there's all this margin. So I think that's really cool. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just right, right now starting to plan out the third season for the wild fed TV show and it's springtime and I'm ready to get, you know, filming in the next month or so. And I had not thought about pheasant back and that would be such a great, so I really, I appreciate that little tip <laughs> there, man. Um, anything else that you want to mention that uh, you're excited about in the coming uh, season here um, and that you're starting to think about doing? You know, I'm just really excited to get out there in general. Yeah. Um, you know, I I assume just like in Maine, I mean, how long is your winter there? Like Ours is like year. seven months yeah, here. All year. Yeah, it's basically. <laughs> yeah. Actually, as we, yeah. you know, because it's uh, what today's, you know, first week, end of the first week of April, and I'm looking at outside right now, and it's actually snowing. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, we were covered. We've been covered in snow, too. Yeah, it was snowing right at the beginning of our... Um, interview here yeah. and it has stopped and melted i mean i think we're in fake spring or we could yeah, be in right. second or third fake spring right. i can't tell <laughs> Same, yeah. anymore <laughs> yeah but it's all gonna start soon man so you'll be you'll be getting out what in the next month or so it'll get really kicking off yeah i think so you know right at the end of april yeah and i love the idea that you're gonna do some traveling this year that's been one of the most rewarding things you know about making my tv show is just getting to go to different places and meet the foragers there and kind of see what they get excited about, what they're interested in. So 
yeah very excited for you and to get to travel with sam will be really fun he's a hoot <laughs> so yeah uh, if you come if you come by minnesota it'd be great to see you yeah um I, that's probably going to happen in fact i'm I'm trying to get out there um this year so uh, let's stay in touch about that and um why don't you tell folks uh, again where they can find you how they can get into one of your classes um about your social medias all that kind of stuff Sure. Yeah. My company is called Ironwood Foraging Co. Um, I'm based in Minneapolis. I have a website. You can just type in ironwoodforaging.com or co. Either one works. You've got a blog um, on there, by the f- way. I want to just send people, you yeah. know, that that um, Japanese beetle uh, post is up there and I uh, really highly recommend people check that out. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I do have the blog on there. I should probably put more effort into it, um, but I don't really like being inside it long enough to <laughs> yeah, you know write exactly. these posts down. I always like find time to write when it's the winter time because I'm so incredibly bored. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you want to find me on uh, social media as well, um, my Instagram is at MN Forager. Uh, so the abbreviation for Minnesota Forager. Um, yeah, I post memes on there. Um, kind of a steady stream of nature memes as well as like, you know, make posts and reels about foraging. It's been uh, great to finally connect with you, Tim. I I do hope to get out there in person and connect with you as well. And obviously, uh, I'm a resource out here in Maine if you ever need anything. So let's stay in touch, man. And uh, looking forward to talking to you more in the future. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.